This short presentation, which is taken from the Cape Clear training course, will teach you what you need to know to get started using XML. XML, or Extensible Markup Language, is a format designed to allow documents to be easily read by both humans and applications. The core concept within XML is the element. An element has a start tag consisting of the element name enclosed between a less than and a greater than sign. The end tag is identified with an additional forward slash character, and between the two tags is the data value. XML documents can contain multiple elements, and elements can contain other elements creating a hierarchy. An XML document must have a single top-level element known as the root element or document element, and there must be matching end tags for each of the start tags. Such an XML document is often referred to as well-formed. Elements can be empty, as shown here, and there is an abbreviated syntax for empty elements consisting of a single tag that includes the forward slash character. It does not matter which syntax is used, they are equivalent. Let's give this element some contents and move on. An XML document can have more than one element with the same name as shown here. Note that our document now contains the phrase greater than within the text. What if you need to use the greater than symbol as part of your text? In XML this character is already used to denote tags. An escape sequence using the abbreviation GT can be used. These escape sequences are known as entities. There are four entities defined by XML as shown here. Such escape sequences can also be used to specify character codes. However, you are unlikely to encounter entities other than the ones shown here. Elements can have attributes attached to them as shown in this example. These are name value pairs included within the start tag of the element. An element can have multiple attributes as long as the names are unique. The order of the attributes does not matter. Comments can be added to documents using the exclamation mark and dash characters as shown here. Each XML document starts with a prolog. This first line declares the document as containing XML. The version number refers to the original version of the XML syntax. This is almost universally used and unless you need the enhancements relating to character sets provided by XML 1.1, you are strongly advised to stay with version 1.0. The character set used within the XML document is declared as the encoding. Here we see the UTF-8 character set has been used. The widespread use of XML documents resulted in a situation where several different organizations might create documents using the same element names. The concept of dividing elements into namespaces was introduced. The equivalent concept exists in almost all programming languages where definitions can be divided into packages or modules. Here we see a namespace added into the document as a special attribute XML NS. A namespace is a URI, or Unique Resource Identifier. It doesn't have to look like a URL, as shown in our example, but many people fall into this habit. The namespace does not necessarily identify a document on the internet, and you are most likely to get a page not found error if you try to point a web browser at the location provided. However, this syntax does provide a convenient way to identify the company and group that have designed the XML document structure. The XML NS attribute, shown here, sets the default namespace. This sets the namespace for the element it is attached to, and also for all child elements. Child elements are, of course, free to declare their own default namespace, overriding the one they inherit from their parent. Now that we have namespaces, we think of each element as having a qualified name, or QName for short. A QName is the combination of the namespace and the element name, and should uniquely identify the element in documents you design and distinguish them from those in documents designed by others. You might need to use more than one namespace within a single document. You can do this by setting the default namespace on each element. Alternatively, there is another syntax that allows namespace prefixes to be declared. Here we see the prefix TNS being declared. These do not set a default namespace. Instead, the prefix needs to be used as part of the element name within the start tag and end tags. Namespace prefixes may also be used to qualify attribute names. Here you can see that the prefix has not been applied to the elements called text. As there is no default namespace declared, we refer to these elements as being unqualified. Let's add a namespace to these remaining elements before moving on. So here it is, our XML document. The XML syntax is easily readable and its formal structure means that applications can also extract data from the document. 
the use of the element names within tags means that the document is self-describing. It, I haven't described what the document is for, but it is immediately obvious to you what its purpose is. However, it would still be good to have a description of what the structure of the document should be. I could use this description to ensure that everyone constructs documents in a consistent way, and it could even be used to automatically validate documents. For this purpose, we use XML schema. Let's create an XML schema that describes our XML document. An XML schema is itself an XML document. It describes each element in the document. The values that an element can contain are described by assigning each element a data type. There are several built-in data types that can be used in XML schema. The most commonly used ones are shown here. The namespace used in our document can be specified in the schema using the target namespace. For convenience, we also declare a namespace prefix, as we might want to refer to this namespace later. XML schema also provides a way to specify which elements may be qualified and which ones remain unqualified. From experience, most people have learned that it's best to qualify all the elements, and this is indicated here by setting the default to be qualified. Elements that, con that contain other elements are defined as shown here using complex types. We refer to elements that don't contain other elements as being declared using simple types. XML schema has the concept of a content model that defines the rules for how the child elements can be arranged. For our document, we want the child elements to appear in the same order in the document as they are declared in the XML schema. In other words, they will appear in sequence. If we don't care which order they appear in, we can use the all content model. You can also state that only one of the elements described in the XML schema can be used at any one time within the XML document using the choice content model. Attributes are defined in a similar way to elements. They are placed here just inside the complex type. In our document, the element called text appeared twice. We can express this in the XML schema using max occurs. As you can guess, this states that the maximum number of times that an element may be repeated in the document. If there is no limit, then we say it is unbounded. You can set a minimum number using minocurs. If your element is optional, use a minocurs of zero. Attributes are optional by default. You can state that an attribute must appear on the element simply by stating that its use is required. New simple types can be created based on XML schema's built-in types. Here we see one described, one declared based on the data type string. We do this in order to specify constraints on the value. In this case, we have specified that a text element can contain at most 100 characters. The set of ways in which we can constrain the value of a data type are known as the constraining facets. These facets can be applied to any values, but are commonly used with strings. We can specify maximum and minimum values for numeric data types. They can also be used for any data types where there is a logical order, such as a date. And finally, there are a set of facets for use with decimal and floating point numbers. Definitions in an XML schema can be declared globally and then reused elsewhere. We say that a definition is global if it is immediately inside the schema root element. Elements, attributes, complex types, and simple types can all be declared globally and then reused. Here we see the addition of a second global element to our XML schema. This global element can now be referenced from elsewhere within the XML schema. So here it is, our completed XML schema. Of course, you don't need to write XML schemas by hand, as shown here. Now that you understand the concepts, you can use a graphical editor. Here is what the same XML schema looks like in a graphical editor. I do hope you enjoyed our brief introduction to XML and XML schema. If you need to learn more, visit capeclear.com or come to one of our training courses.